Greetings, students. We're going to talk about film history this week. So, um, this is a presentation I haven't done in a long time, to be honest. So, I hope I don't stumble too much. Bear with me. But uh, I think it's important for you guys to understand a little bit more about film history, being that you're going to be filmmakers in the near future. So, um, this is something I created back in uh, when I was teaching high school in New Mexico, and I've updated it today to give you kind of a little bit better view. But um, here we go. So, um, motion picture today uh, is the greatest medium of expression the world has ever known. It is capable of giving life and form to all ideas, practical and emotional. Its only limitation is human ingenuity. Great quote, huh? Uh, that was John Seitz, ASC cinematographer back in 1930. That's, you know, the beauty of this is that film is eternal. What we create now lives beyond our, our years on this planet. So um, that's part of the beauty of this medium is that it lives beyond you. And uh, you're creating things that can create, that can change the world, that can literally change the world. So keep that in mind. That's a, that's a big responsibility. Um, as you start your careers and, and create work, you need to be responsible. So here we go. Um, this charming, handsome gentleman uh, is Edward Maybridge. Uh, Ed Weird, weird spelling, right? But he's a Brit, you know. Um, he was this English photographer who emigrated to the U.S. and was looking to make his fame and fortune. And he got somehow connected with uh, Stanford, <coughs> Leland Stanford, of which Stanford University is, is named. And... Uh, Leland was a former governor of California, and Leland was hanging out with his buddies one day and arguing about whether or not his racehorses uh, had at least one foot on the ground all the time. Turns out that uh, he went to Maybridge to solve this, this bet that they had among them, a gentleman's bet perhaps, but he ended up paying Maybridge over $50,000 to solve this bet. I guess he had a lot of money. What can you say, right? So... <clears throat> but Maybridge spent years on it. Took a couple of years out to go to jail for killing his wife's lover. Long story. Fascinating guy. You wouldn't think it to look at him, would you? No, I know, right? Okay. What he did, though, was come up with a device that would um, trigger the camera's shutter. He had to come up with a faster shutter because shutters at this point, it took several seconds to create a photographic image. So he had to come up with a shutter that could create a really instantaneous image to freeze a horse's motion in stride. And so he came up with it and mounted it on a number of different cameras and then came up with a triggering mechanism to trigger that shutter and take a series of photographs all of a horse as it was running past the camera to determine whether or not and there was one point or, or more where all four hooves were off the ground at the same time. So this is this series of images that he got. And as you can see, the horse's hooves are indeed off the ground. You knew that, right? I mean, why would these guys not know that? I don't know. You know, they're, they've got more money than sense, I guess. I don't know. Um, but um, the discovery soon made that $25,000 wager uh, look like penny, petty you know, pocket change. So, here you go. That's the actual footage. Isn't that cool? That they actually have this footage. Um, so, that's what it looks like. And you can see, indeed, the horses' hooves are all off the ground at the same time. Uh, they were shot in one-tenth of a second interviews. Ten frames per second. And you can see it's really stuttered. It's really, you know, kind of shaky. Um, of course, now... Um, we do the 24 frame standard in theaters, 30 frame standard on uh, television. So it's a lot faster frame rate than there was in this day, but that was the frame rate of the day. So um, now we gave names to the two factors that create this illusion of motion. And, um, and these are the, that's the illusion that, that is the basis for the medium that we are creating, motion pictures and television. So the Phi phenomenon uh, explains why when you view a series of slightly different photographs 
or uh, still photographs or images in rapid succession, an illusion of movement is created in the transition between the images. Your eye has a refresh rate. It's a little slower than uh, instantaneous. It's several times a second, well, 24 or 30, depending on the way you look at it. They call them flicks for a reason. Um, being that we look at movies at 24 frames per second, there is a little flicker there. Our eyes actually refresh a little faster than 24 frames a second. You don't really notice it with 30 frames a second. You certainly don't notice it at 60 frames a second. So, but that's the phi phenomenon. And then persistence of vision <coughs> uh, explains why the intervals between the successive images merge into a single images, image as our eyes hold that uh, one image for long enough for the next one to take its place. So, those two scientific phenomena are at the base of film and the illusion of motion in film. Now, um, as you see here, the illusion of motion is created, um, even though it's 10 frames per second, but um, motion pictures, again, are 24. Now, photography didn't come around immediately. Its roots are way back when, in pre, uh, before the time of Christ, um, in, uh, you know, medieval, well, it was way after the time of Christ, but uh, the camera obscura has been around for centuries, millennia. And the camera obscura is just a phenomenon where if you put a small hole in an object that's large enough, it, pro it, it will create uh, a projection of whatever's on the other side of that large object in a darkened room on the opposite wall. The object is upside down and reversed, 180 degrees. But that is the basis of photography, is that you can use that pinhole, um, known as a camera obscura, to create an image on some sort of a substrate or an Im a, a, a flat surface. That's what happens inside of a camera. That's what happens basically on a uh, CCD or an imaging chip. Now, another important invention uh, prior to motion pictures was the Magic Lantern. The Magic Lantern um, was an entertainment device. And they were small slides that were painted on glass and then uh, through a light source, usually a candle or something like that, and a concave mirror uh, projecting it through a lens at the front it projected the image then onto a screen or onto a wall, and people actually went for entertainment at Magic Lantern shows. And this is pretty much the pre precursor of theatrical motion pictures, right? Uh, same thing. <coughs> it was a popular form of entertainment in its day. Now, along the same time, there's a new invention coming out called a fanatoscope. Fanatoscope. Um, also known as a phantoscope, a lot easier to say. Um, but it basically took a, a series of images and you look through a small slot and you spin this disc and it looks like the images are animated. Still prior to photography, but these are paintings or illustrations. So here's an example of what it looks like. Um, and it's pretty effective. You know, it was a children's toy, but it was a very popular children's toy because it gave the illusion of motion. Now, other inventions about that time were the zoetrope and the praxinoscope. The zoetrope, of course, was the uh, what uh, Francis Ford Coppola calls his production company in New York. That's the Zo zoetrope productions. Um, based upon this invention, the zoetrope, again, did the same thing. You just put your eye down, at, even with that little slot and spun it and you would look through the slot at the opposite side of this cylinder and each image would then it's like a flip book right you've done flip books in school uh, basically the same concept now in 1822 finally photography comes into the fore um, frenchman joseph nepsey um, came up with a photographic image pl uh, uh, plate it wasn't really a plate. It was, um, it, in the day, uh, it was actually on metal, uh, pieces of metal, 
And, it, and the photographic chemicals were not very effective at that time. They weren't real photosensitive. It took a long period of time for the photographic image to develop. And, and as you see, they're not very good. Um, now, Daguerre came along about this time. Uh, and Daguerre, another Frenchman, improved on that image and uh, uh, that uh, photographic uh, emulsion process. And his images then were pretty elaborate compared to Nepsis. But this was in the 1830s. Now, think about that. 1830s, this is prior to Civil War, right? That's why there's photographic images of Abraham Lincoln and soldiers uh, and, you know, perhaps your ancestors. So um, pretty impressive that that has been around. So the photography has been around since the 1830s. Now, it wasn't until the 1880s that the photographic uh, emulsion was moved from originally metal plates onto glass plates and then onto flexible celluloid. And Hannibal Goodwin was the one who simplified the process by creating the pliable film uh, base called celluloid. Now, um, this is par probably a familiar image to most of you. Uh, this is the friends George Eastman and Thomas Edison. Eastman of Eastman Kodak fame. Eastman then took that pliable film base and standardized it. And Edison, being that they were friends, and the inventor of the one of the early motion picture cameras, was able to take that and then expand upon that, make it even more um, universally accepted. So the two of them together managed to put forward this, this new... Uh, pliable film base in a standard uh, width, or 16 millimeters or 35 millimeters for commercial use. Now, once it was standardized, motion picture film was 35 millimeters wide, had sprocket holes on each side, geared teeth fit into those sprocket holes and pulled the film through the uh, uh, shutter of the projector or the, of the camera at 24 frames a second. Now, um, now that there's film, motion pictures, how do you present them to the public? Edison thought the ultimate way was going to be in little peep shows um, with kinetoscopes or kinetographs. Um, Edison invented this device thinking he could sell a lot of them. Basically, he was a businessman. Um, very mercenary businessman. And um, so he invented a device where one person at a time could watch a motion picture on a projection device. And um, that is his, you know, big claim to fame at the time. And he would open these parlors with a number of these devices, basically sell them to the parlor owners, and then he would produce the films that then went into those kinetoscopes. So, there's a kinetoscope parlor of about the turn of the century, 1899, and he would then make all of the product that would go into them. So he got them on the projectors, and he got them on the product. Pretty creative, if you think about it. Now, um, from his perspective, one machine for every viewer was more to be desired than 100 or more viewers for every machine. But that's the inside of one of his projectors. It was a continuous film loop, and they were just short films, just films about nothing, really. He had a film of somebody sneezing. He had a film of uh, the first New Mexico film was uh, Indian Day School. It was shot at Isleta Pueblo, had a bunch of kids walking out a door and around in a little circle and then back into the door. That was it. But people were amazed. They were fascinated with this. This was the new medium, and it was very popular because nobody had seen anything like this before. So, um, but he didn't believe that people would be interested in sitting around in a group watching a movie together. Now, enter the Lumiers. Long about the same time in France, where the roots of photography were, the Lumiere brothers were inventing their own device. This is an amazing piece of, of equipment, I've got to tell you. Um, it was a camera that would expose the, the film stock and then, uh, and then recoil it inside the camera, and then you could develop it outside the camera, put it back in the camera, and it became a projector. I mean, what a, a creative way of, of uh, creating motion pictures. 
The projector then could be watched by a number of people at the same time. The Lumieres were watch, belt, betting on the more standard way of our seeing films these days, which is a number of people watching them on a big screen. <coughs> Their invention was called the cinematograph, and it was incredibly popular. They would have these cinematograph showings in uh, theaters and cafes, and they would show a number of short subjects. And they were, uh, you know, people would stand in line to come into the theater and watch these short subjects. And their things were like feeding baby, number of guys playing cards, um, a train coming into a station, which I believe I've got a, an example of here. Um, Lumiers were called actuality, shot indoors on or outdoors on location. Edison's films were circus performers, vaudeville characters, and he shot them in a small studio on his New Jersey property that uh, he called the Black Mariah. It was this, this large metal building with a cantilevered roof that would open up and allow him to use natural lighting inside. The Lumiers, totally different path, but they're both pioneers of the film industry. Now, Edison at some point realized, well, it's going to probably be the Lumiere's invention that is the most popular, so he came up with his own projector and um, created the Nickelodeon, which started off with vaudeville shows and short subject films in between to fill in between the acts. Um, now, ironically, he paid for his patents in the U.S., but he didn't patent his invention foreign. $150 would have done it, so anybody could invent anything, and a lot of people did. There were a lot of inventions out there. Um, so, movie machines. This is uh, Alfred Wrench's Cinematograph of 1898. Um, during this time, vaudeville, small theaters that featured short dramatic skits, comedy routines, songs, and dance numbers, were popular. But in order to get a one up on the competition and fill his time between, or to fill the time between acts, vaudeville added Edison's films in between their, their show business acts. So, um, for a nickel in the beginning of the 1900s, you could go in and watch a series of acts and a series of short films. The films became incredibly popular. They became almost the highlight of the, the presentation and um, these film, these vaudeville theaters were known as Nickelodeons because you would pay a nickel to go and see the acts. As films got more popular and longer, the vaudeville acts disappeared from the Nickelodeons and the motion picture theater was born. If you can call a small room with wooden benches a motion picture theater. Um, as their popularity grew, films had to be changed often. But this is a Nickelodeon of the 1900s. Um, in the early days, film action resembled a short stage play. The action was continuous and uninterrupted. There was no editing yet. But um, this allowed a new film to re be released every few days, which meant that people would come back time and time again, pay their nickel, and see a new mo movie. So it was a cash cow, basically. So here is Lumiere's train coming into a station. This has been restored in 4K and 60 frames. It looks amazing, it really does. Look it up on YouTube because it's worth seeing. But Lumiere's, if you look at Edison's by comparison, Edison's were really poor quality. The Lumiere's actually, their uh, movie machine was much more effective, much higher quality. What's amazing is to look at these people, they're completely oblivious. They don't think about the fact there's a camera watching them because they don't know what it is, right? They've never seen a camera before, so they have no frame of reference. So they're completely natural in front of the camera. They're not self-conscious. Now, so uh, early studios had to turn out large numbers of film to meet the demand. A couple of films every, every week, that meant that you had to be in production pretty much all the time. So the studios of the early 1900s were appropriately called film factories because they were cranking them out. Um, at that time, they were primarily located in New York and New Jersey. People were not making movies in California. California was the, the West. It was wild, untamed land at this point. There weren't any movies out there. So um, 
but that would soon change. So this is Edison's Black Mariah. This is basically a large oven uh, with a cantilevered roof. You can see how the roof would open, but um, it filled hot metal walls and a track and a, an attached dark room where he would immediately take the film in and process it. And he could turn out films almost instantaneously that way. So now rumor has it the whole idea of cutting from one scene to another resulted from a director on a tight schedule. Due to a camera malfunction, malfunction, a scene was lost and there wasn't time to reshoot it. And he realized by leaving it out, he improved the action. So that was, that's the rumor. I don't know if it's true, but it makes good sense. If you think about compressing action as we do in movies now, it makes perfect sense that you would leave a scene out that wasn't really necessary to the story, but it would make the speed of the motion picture go faster. Now, after viewing the mistake, it was concluded that the lost footage wasn't really necessary and the jump in action actually speeded things along. By the late 1800s, it was accepted practice to stop and reposition the camera and to cut directly to a totally different scene to tell a story. People were becoming more sophisticated as viewers at this point, right? Okay, 1903, Edwin S. Porter, an employee of Edison's, uh, shot the first narrative film, the first film that tells a story. Um, it was The Great Train Robbery, the film, and actually has been remade uh, over the years. The film featured a dramatic storyline and cross-cutting between different locations and camera angles. It had 14 scenes and lasted 12 minutes. That was an epic of its day. Now, here's the last scene in The Great Train Robbery. The desperado shooting at the camera. Now, believe it or not, that freaked people out. That was so frightening to people of the day that people actually passed out in the theaters. Um, so that was, and actually, censorship has already reared its ugly head at this point too. Edison had some films that were considered risque. One of them was nothing more than two people kissing. That was considered porn, okay, of the day. And they're fully clothed. You know, there, and he's kissing her cheek, um, but it was considered pornography. It was pornographic. Hard to believe that we've come as far as we have, or maybe not. But um, but that was, uh, you know, the first example of censorship. A lot of theaters weren't allowed to to show that movie. Um, there's another one that Edison has. You can look it up with a girl on a trapeze taking her clothes off with a couple of. Uh, Pervs sitting in the audience cheering her on. So, um, there you go. Uh, Porter borrowed some of his ideas from European directors, in particular from a F Frenchman, again, named Georges Millet. Um, if you've seen Hugo, you know who Georges Millet is because he is featured in Hugo, the movie Hugo. Um, Hugo is virtually credited with coming up with special effects, the originator of special effects. His movie, A Trip to the Moon, uh, even though it's crude by today's standards, was amazing in 1902. 1902. This is about 30 years into the history of motion pictures. Look at this movie and, you know, put it in perspective. Um, I mean, it's corny, but it's amazing, you know, that he was able to accomplish what he was in the day. Stop motion, uh, animation, all of these things had their roots in Georges Millet. This is the kiss, um, the kiss that started um, the beginning of censorship in this country. Uh, the Widow Jones uh, was the stage play that it was based upon, but it was uh, considered obscene. Responding to political pressure of the day, the U.S. Supreme Court officially denied motion pictures the same First Amendment freedom that applies to everything else. And um, freedom of the press, First Amendment, right? But they said they're entertainment, it's not news, it doesn't deserve First Amendment rights. I don't know how that worked, but that was the Supreme Court of the day. And so, uh, as a result of the decision, most states elected boards to make sure that films shown in their areas adhered to their particular view of morality. So different states set the standards at that point for what was considered moral and what was considered immoral.
Almost 50 years later, the Supreme Court finally reversed itself, allowing films the same First Amendment rights as other mass media. So, films were selected and, and um, you know, kind of almost discriminated against in a way in their early days. Now, <clears throat> at this point, there's still no sound and no color. Dialogue appeared as full-frame text on the screen after the actors uh, spoke their lines, not as graphics on the screen, but as individual frames, black frames usually with white dialogue on them, saying what the actors were saying. Later, the dialogue was superimposed over the picture as shown here. The advantage of this is it's easy to dub dialogue into any language. You can change for your different um, countries that you distribute your film in by no doing nothing but changing the title graphics in between the scenes. Now, the celluloid film was wound on reels, as shown in the left. Uh, since the reels only held about 12 minutes of film, they had to be changed during projection and during filming. Um, if the projection wa production was longer than one reel, there was an intermission while the reels were switched until they went to the multi projector system in most theaters. And that was around until just about 10 years ago when they went to a disc system in the theaters. But you would have originally one uh, projector, you would have a pianist playing music to go with the movie, and they would fill the gaps as the reels were changing with music, musical interludes. Um, later proje two projectors, and this is an image of the two projectors side by side, uh, making instant switchover possible. Today, continuous projection is possible with one projection since the reels are edited together and fed from a, a turntable. But remember, I did this a few years ago. That was how things were done then. Now it's all digital. And that's it for this one. Take the part of the quiz that you can answer right now and then uh, come back and watch the second half.